Hello and welcome back to In the Envelope, an awards podcast. I am, as always, your host, Jack Smart, the awards editor at Backstage, your guide to the acting industry and the most trusted name in casting. We are here to give you a behind-the-scenes look at some of the buzziest contenders for the small screen's biggest trophy, the Emmy Award. This season of In the Envelope is brought to you by HBO. You will be one-dimensional if you don't if you don't have all of those other things that make up your tapestry. And also part of that tapestry is who will you be that is of service to others? That's the job we're in. Hello and good morning and good afternoon and possibly good evening, listeners. We have a whopper of an episode for you today. (laughs) Yeah. A double whopper? Is that a thing? Double decker. Is that a Burger King? <laughs> Is that a sandwich? A Burger King sponsorship. <laughs> I did talk about burgers with our the second guest on our podcast today, Catherine <laughs> Hahn. <laughs> um, what a segue! What a segue! First up, we have Judith Light, and then we have Catherine Hahn, who are both actresses on Amazon's exquisite comedy, Transparent, which is created, written, and often directed by Jill Soloway. I think we should get right to it, because we have to get to the brilliance that is Judith Light and then Catherine Hahn. Um, In this first interview with Judith, it must be said, she is such an amazing presence. And she took one look at Jamie, first of all, and was immediately like, where are you? Hello, who are you? And she was just so lovely in the studio. Um, At one point, I thought she was going to start interviewing me. Um, So just a warning to listeners, this is a really this is a really intense talk. It's quite intimate and deep and philosophical, and I, um, it's inspiring, I think. We talked a lot about what it means to be inspired and what it means to be a human, and uh, you better buckle up because it's, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's serious stuff. It's, it's serious, serious stuff. I mean, I think we should just get right to it because no one says it better than Judith herself. Certainly. All right, let's, let's get to the interview. All right, let's take a short break and then go to our... Two interviews with the stars of Amazon's Transparent. Judith Light is a national treasure of stage and screen, a two-time Tony Award-winning actor for her work on Broadway stages, and two-time Daytime Emmy Award winner, best known for the ABC sitcom Who's the Boss? She currently stars on Jill Soloway's Amazon comedy Transparent, for which she has nominated her second consecutive Emmy Award. She also has one of the most beautiful voices you will ever hear on this podcast. Here it is, our interview with Judith Light. you come to be doing this? How did you, what is your... Are you interviewing me? Yes, I've just... I love that. Yes. Um, I... I love your name. Oh, thank you. So great. Jack Smart. It is my real name. Um, Judith Light is my real name, too. <laughs> no, people ask me. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, Don't you love having that name? I kind of do. Yes, I'm smart. That's right. Exactly. My <gasps> branding is right in my I'm name. I'm so brainy. And so good. It's great. Um, I've been at Backstage for three years, and I've... I I've, love Backstage. I know you do. I know. You know I do, right? I know. Yeah. You were recently on our cover. Yeah. And, and you had lots of brilliant things to share for working actors, and I want to... Thank you. ...cover some of that again. Sure, absolutely. Um, because absolutely. you... I was you, just at the O'Neill talking to oh, some yeah. of their students. I've I was, been there, too. I've studied there as a, as a theater you? critic. Yeah. You were just there. Yes. my uh, Well, I got the Monte Cristo Award this year. Oh, right. and and, oh, congratulations. Um, and Preston right. Whiteway asked me if I would come up and see. Oh, cool! Uh, Which program? Talk to the to talk to the students uh-huh. and um, and Amy Landecker was doing a play there, a oh. Stephen Belbert play. So I got to see oh. Amy do the reading and. How interesting! It was so great, and cool. she was amazing. She's, she's so great. Yeah, she's just I'm such a huge fan of hers. Yeah. <gasps> so you guys are a family. Oh, the, the five sure. of you. Are we talking yet? Yeah, I think we. Yeah. Are we? Oh, great. Yeah, I think we're official. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, oh, we are a family. I think. Oh, no question. You guys are so tight knit and so. It, very. It bleeds very onto the screen, I think. Which well, is lovely. you know, one of those things is like when you would watch a, a, uh, a show that first started. Let's say you see the pilot, right? Yeah. Right. And you go, mm, 
not a family yet. Right. Nah, Especially gotta, for like need, family sitcoms or yeah. comedies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Five weeks into it, six episodes into it, you go, oh, now mm-hmm. they're a family. They have a Got rhythm. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one was immediate. Right. Look, I've known Jeffrey for all these years. We started off in repertory gotcha. theater together, mm-hmm. Milwaukee Rep, and we're just really, really good friends. Wonderful. And um, the I knew Amy's work. I knew Gabby's work. I knew Jay's work. I knew about Jill Soloway. Hmm. And so when we came into this, Jill had us work with this woman named Joan Shekel, and we did Joan's workshop. I don't know if Jay talked to you about that at mm-hmm. all, but we did Joan's workshop. And one of the things that Joan was really high on and what Jill really wanted from us was to have that kind of feeling of intimacy, that these people mm-hmm. ate off each other's plate, For decades. were blood and bone and yeah. and water of each other and i th- and that's what you got immediately from sure. the pilot and transparent you knew that Definitely. these people were that kind of connected yeah that kind of that the way that families annoy each other and there's <sighs> strife and there's conflict and it's just everyday conflict it's just routine it's, that's right that's right yeah. and it somebody says something in passing that is a discount to somebody else and yeah. it gets swept under that's the rug and then everybody has an argument and they bring that up and say why did you say that to me uh-huh. it is yeah. that kind of familial mm-hmm. which is why i think that the show really is so universal for so many people, why people are so attracted to it. You know, the content is about someone making a transition Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in their life, being authentic, coming out, Mm -hmm. saying to everyone, this is my true self. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now who will you be? And I don't think there's a person in the world who doesn't have somebody in their family that says something of that ilk to them at some point in time. The content right. is different, but it is a familiar story, and people people know that. They understand that yeah. at an energetic level, which is why I say people don't watch Transparent. They feel yeah. oh, Transparent. That's so true. Right? Yeah. I love the idea that it's one person is transitioning, but it's more about, of course, it's about Mara's transition, but it's about what you then how did you put it how well, well Shelley says in her you know her one woman show where she says yes. when somebody in a family transitions everybody transitions right and which almost feels like the thesis statement of the show i think so yeah and it's like mora says i am this is who i am i have been shoving this down mm-hmm. holding on to this all of my life and I'm yeah. not going to do that anymore. So this is who I am, yeah. authentic and real and me, and this is going to be messy. And so messy, I was going to say. Who will you yeah. be? Who are you? And that poses the question to every single one of us, mm-hmm. which is why I have always found such great inspiration in the LGBTQ community, mm-hmm. because it is a community of authenticity of courage, of saying, I am, this is who I am, Mm -hmm. in spite of religion and the culture and the law and the government and their family and their extended family. I know you think I'm this person. I am not. This is Mm. my truth. Mm -hmm. That's why my manager of 36 years, who passed away last October, Herb, always used to say, Everyone has something to come out about. Everyone. Uh, mm. He said, we in the gay community know what it means to have to come out about something. He said to me, you straight people have to figure out what it is that is uh, your truth that you need to talk beautiful. about, that you need to speak to. And how will you be authentic in the world? Right. And so it's not a question of doing. It is a question of being. Which is so much, it's so difficult. It's the biggest challenge we face. Because we face uncertainty. We face yeah. people leaving us, not responding to us. Sure. And that was the question of the first season, which mm-hmm. was, will you still love me if I, yeah. if this is who I am, right. if this is what I tell you, if right. this is my truth? And always in Transparent, I think you feel that love yeah. is the, the, what bu- what binds them, not just that they're family, but there is love there, yeah. no matter what, that they are there for each other. Yeah, that unconditional. They're human. 
Yeah. They're flawed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when like they're everybody, in transition. There's parts of everybody we don't like. Sure. We don't yeah. like them. <laughs> right. And there's other parts that we absolutely adore. Yeah. Um, but just because they're not likable doesn't make them infinitely interesting. Oh, yeah, for sure. Right? Especially, as you're saying, in the in the wake of, of big dramatic changes. And, and that thing of exposing yourself and saying, this is who I am, or this is who I'm trying to be or become... I love that. I let's. I want to ask too about that. You've been an LGBT advocate forever, mm-hmm. from the very beginning, yeah. and you've said that it really does inspire you. And I love that it's because the, often the people in the LGBT community are felt like they're on the outside of things, or that they are discriminated against, and that source of um, trying to find your genuine self that does inspire you as an actor. It inspires that informs me your process. as a human being. Mm-hmm. I mean. Mm-hmm. Which inspire, which inspires every aspect of my life cool. as a human yeah. being. I want to be the most authentic person that I can be. And during the height of the AIDS pandemic, I watched the community and mm-hmm. was inspired by. I mean, this is, this takes bravery mm-hmm. to be your real self in the world. Yeah, to come out in the face of all the things that I was just talking about before. Yeah, what to and we look at the transgender community. Right. And the hate crimes that are, uh, the, and the way that they are put upon, and the way that they've been shoved into the mm-hmm. shadows, and the way that we have discounted them as human beings. Talk about be saying, this is who I am. Mm-hmm. The courage that it takes, the, the what it takes to do that mm-hmm. in the face of a world that is not accepting. Mm-hmm. And so, yes, it, from the beginning, I watched my friends dying. Mm-hmm. And I watched people I didn't know, young men who were dying whose families left them alone precisely because they discounted them because they right. had AIDS and then they found out that they were gay. And in the, mm. in, in, in the middle of all of that, they stood up and they said, this is who I am. Yeah. The courage. Mm-hmm. And the community. And, and the, the community. And right. when... Relying on each other. There was no nothing forthcoming. The government wasn't forthcoming Certainly with anything. Not. Nothing. Nope. And it was the lesbian community who said, you know what? You are up. our brothers. We will help you. We mm-hmm. will do this. Yeah. We we are That's there nice. for you. And because there had been a kind of rift in the communities, and mm-hmm. these these women came in, and they took over. They gave everything that they had. Mm-hmm. You watch that and you can not be I I couldn't be unmoved by that, mm. inspired. Yeah. By that. Watching what was happening, what which what was happening in our political situation, mm-hmm. our government, and then there were people like Larry Kramer and who stood up and yeah. act up and you know, writing plays like the normal heart and as is and and all of these things that were were happening as a result of this was the the rejuvenation mm. as they were dying right. of a community. Uh. The the paradox of that I think is just so incredibly powerful. And so I said I want to be yeah. like that. Yeah. I want to be. I want to be that brave. I want to be that courageous. I want to be like Elizabeth Taylor, yeah. who speaks truth to power, like Elizabeth and Taylor, who said, "My advocates. friend Rock Hudson is sick, and you will help him." Mm-hmm. It's like there was these no precedent are for her our doing that. models. These are mm-hmm. our role models. I think for me, these that's sure. what this has been, well, and that's why when I had my audition with Jill Soloway, yeah. it was a Skype call where we talked for forty five minutes about our advocacy. That was that's what, we, and I, I yeah. just I knew that I I had to work with her. I, ha- I mean, how perfect to, that that's how you got the how you got the part. The, here's the, the that's the magic I think, and the 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 guidance of the universe. This is like mm. how do you how do you have something that is your your work and your art mm. intermeshed so with yes. your advocacy. It's just And it's rare. It's very rare. Right? It doesn't very seem that rare. Therese Rakan, for example, is an ex- is an opportunity for you to advocate for the LGBT community or some or something. Except 
Ooh. except in the process of, of drawing inspiration and of finding the strength in these characters. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that all comes in. It's a part of me now. It's the mm -hmm. tapestry mm -hmm. of my work and my life. Cool. I mean, it's sort of diff I, I can't separate them. Do you right. know what I mean? If I'm right. bringing all of me to Therese Rakan, yeah. all of that comes with there's another being that's created out of those mm. words and that interaction with those that's actors right. and that period of time mm -hmm. but it's still it's still um there's all of me and mm -hmm. things that yeah move in me that the process that you use that you undergo to create a character is very much fueled by inspiration and fueled by influences and fueled by the, that tapestry of who you are yeah. yeah and there's there's always someone there's always that that character we are millions and yeah, millions yeah. of characters <laughs> all of us the, yeah. all of us sure. that's why one actor doing hamlet is different than another actor doing hamlet yeah. you're bringing you you you're bringing your depth your tapestry your understanding that's what i always said to say to young actors mm -hmm. learn everything you can L go to every museum go to every mm -hmm. play read every book do everything that i mean that was the great the training at carnegie was so great because mm -hmm. it was we were focused yeah. on the training in the theater but we were also we had liberal arts courses that we had to do, and so we were always yeah. reading. We were always extending ourselves out in into other areas. You cannot be, you will be one dimensional if you don't if you don't have all of those other things yeah. that make up your tapestry. And also, part of that tapestry is who will you be in the world? Mm -hmm. Who will you the, yeah. not not what will you do? World. Who will you be? That is of service to others. Mm -hmm. That's the job yeah. we're in. We're in a service business. Yeah. This business of, and I say, I've said it so many times in so many interviews, this is the giving of the performance. This is mm -hmm. the giving of the self to the team that is creating this experience. Yeah. And when you work with Jill Soloway, that is the way you experience it. Right. You come into that, and at the table read, before we start reading, she speaks of gratitude mm -hmm. and how we have the blessing and the gift of being able to do this kind of work. Right. The work, especially in this project, is the advocacy. Like, there's no, there's very little difference between the you two. You watch Jeffrey Tambor, and you watch right. him take responsibility for mm. all of this. Yeah. And it is magnificent. It's huge. It's so huge. And it's it's hard to think of it now. I know it's only been three seasons, but it's hard to think of how huge the show is in terms of the L the T in the LGBT com community movement becoming mainstream. That That's transparent was a huge part of that. We it's like Jeffrey said the arrow had been shot out of the out of the bow and mm. we were part of yeah. that bow that was already in the air and moving it was in its process of happening i right. mean it was it was there i mean if you look at transgender legal you you see that the stories and the issues and mm. the in the world was was happening. It's I mean, ready to come to the forefront. My beloved of our... Laverne Cox was Absolutely. out there. My Jenny Boylan. There were there yep. were people that were moving through the world, speaking this yeah. and saying, "Attention must be paid." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now, going into season four, it's just a fourth round of in promoting transparent. I mean, Jay said this in our interview. He said promoting transparent is is advocating it's there's no question representation matters and by appearing on red carpets and by promoting shows and by earning emmy nominations that's all doing a very literal service to the world to there's the no question yeah. there's no question about it which is why all of us all five of us do our very very best to make it to you know whatever we can do to come and talk if it's if, you know like man that's why i appreciate talking to you yeah, yeah. Um, because it's it's about moving this 
this conversation forward. Mm -hmm. Um, And yes, we get to do it. So we turn ourselves inside out to do all of that. Sure. Everybody says, oh, it must be so much fun to do transparent. It is fun. (laughs) That's not the word Mm. I use to describe it. There is great emotional depth that has to be mined that's being Mm -hmm. asked of us every single moment and a kind of discipline and challenge that you have to keep coming up to all the time. Yeah. We're, this is deep, this is deep work. And as you said from the very first episode. Yeah. I mean, would you remember what was your first impression upon, had you read the script before or after um, doing the Skype call? After. Okay. And so you I went into that in. with this, yeah, when I want, 45 when minutes in. of talking about advocacy with Jill. <laughs> yeah, Jenna. right. And then you read the script. And so it, what were your first, yeah. Uh, 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 like Jeffrey said, uh, I'm in. Uh, totally uh, in. I, uh, yeah. And was Jeffrey on board? Yes. And so you and, knew that too? Yes, and Jill knew that we were friends. And I think gotcha. I think my knowing him was partly how I got it too. Mm-hmm. Because I think, um, I think Jill, Jill goes... And trusts her instincts about the energy of people. I mean, yeah. not everybody would think to give me the part of Shelley Pfefferman. No? No. No. How so? Not if you're, not if what you've seen is Angela from Who's the Boss. Uh-huh. <laughs> sure. Do you, do you know what I mean? You know, but what had happened is that, and I'm, which I'm so incredibly grateful for, is mm-hmm. that people saw me as an actor and see me as an actor Mm -hmm. who does so many different kinds of things. And in our business, as, you know, as we're talking along here, this is also for, you know, uh, young actors who are in the business or even, you know, whatever age, Mm -hmm. is that everybody knows how easy it is to get pigeonholed. Right. And the work that one has to do Mm. in order to not have that happen is you have to be on top of it. You have to have great people supporting you. You Mm. have to get great agents, great people on your teams who really make sure that you're making choices that give them an experience that you can do lots of different things. And not to look at the business and say, oh, they don't see me. They only see me this way. Right, right. I remember when I was, I finished Who's the Boss? And Things were, I'd done different pilots and they didn't go and I was doing movies of the week and Herb Mm -hmm. said to me, you need to go back to the theater. Ah, gotcha. And I said, why? (laughs) I've made it big in TV now. I was absolutely terrified. I was terrified. And he said, because you have to let people know, they don't know what you can do and Mm -hmm. you have to let them know what you can do. And so the first thing that I did when I came back to the stage after 22 years was a play called Wit. Mm -hmm. So... Anyway, there was a lot of there, there's a lot of ways you can change people's minds about you, but you have to, you but can't you sit there and that. complain about it. You right. have to you have to you have yeah. to get out there. Yeah, and if you have you to make a different choice. That's when you get pigeonholed. Well, it, it's not only when you get pigeonholed. You it, you have to take responsibility for how people see you, and you have to be willing mm. to let them know that you're willing to work, and that yes. it's like I'm here. I, I'm here to support you and what you're doing mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know so it's similar to what you were saying about of read every play and go to every museum and, and just devour culture and inform you know find the material to inform you as a person because that will inform your work as an actor and it, that it, curiosity is what like drives those actors who are v- really versatile and who work in a lot of different it's that but do it for your life do it because that's the person you want to be mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. Th- that's the that's the larger context. That's a larger way to look at it. Who are you in right. the world? And if you're a person who is not informed about the world around you sure. and the history of the world and hmm. where things are going or, or paths that other people have taken, or you walk through the world uninformed. Mm-hmm. And I, for me, I just... I don't want to be that person. Yeah. The unexamined life to me is not worth living. I want to examine myself, what makes me tick, yeah. why I do the things I do, what things work for me, what things don't work for me, how I make choices. Yeah. All of those things, but you 
you're feeding. It's like, and I've said this to young actors, you are the instrument. You are the mm. violin. <laughs> and you know how to play oh, the violin. Cool. You have to know the instrument. You have to know. You can't just be the violin. You can't just be right. the violin. You have to be everything. And a lot of people find that really daunting and too hard. Oh, of and they want to go, you know what? Never mind. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, and I understand wanting to be comfortable. Um, that was me. Mm. I was like, Herb said, go back to the theater. I said, no, yep. no, right too scared, yep. no, not going to. And so I end up doing a play called Wit and, you know, shave my head and be naked and, <laughs> and do it in New York and on tour for a year and be bald for a year. Right. Yeah. It's like, and face the New York critics. <laughs> okay. And that idea of... um. Uh, being open to and kind of saying yes and and being open to what it, you said what you want to do and what you don't want to do. How when do you say no and when have you? Like when do you find something that because you're informed and you have your finger on the pulse of the of the world and you are living that life? When have you said oh that's not for me? And how does that how do you navigate that as a working actor? Those those choices are very difficult for me to make because I I look at something and I find. People bring me things that are so compelling and mm-hmm. characters that are so compelling and that are so well written. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, if they're not as well written, I can easily say that's I'm like going to pass criteria. on this. But yeah. most of the time, that's not what comes to me. So the, the making the choices is is more difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, I sometimes I have to make it out of time and energy. Like sure. the Only last so season, I was shooting Transparent and doing this play mm-hmm. um, with Al Pacino. So at the same time, so. It's crazy, you know. You the, 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 making the choice to say no is easier. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's because I'm committed to something else. Sometimes it's out of needing to leave space for things to come in. Mm. Um, and I always say, you know, in your in your gut, you know, in your experience, sure. it's not in your head. The decision mm. is not in your head. If you try to make the decision in your head, there's just a lot of noise and a lot of people in there saying, you should do it for this and you shouldn't do it for that. Mm. Um, something That's just tricky. came to me recently that I'm not able to do because of a schedule that I love mm. and that I really, really, really want to do. Mm-hmm. I also know people are starting to give me things that um, require singing. Uh-huh. And I, because of the episode, the, I that. think the... Yeah, I think because of um, Hand in My Pocket. And so uh, I I can't wait to talk about that. You're episode. so su- <laughs> God, you are so adorable. Oh, my God. Does everybody know how out there how cute you are? I have a face for radio. Oh, my God. No, you you have a face for live TV. <laughs> um, um, and I I th- oh, singing. And you, so I you... want to I want to do that. And I have to work on that and yeah. I also I make the choice out of am I ready? Do I want to I want to show up always mm. as my best self. Yeah, that means yeah. my own personal issues out of the way, my own ability oh. to do things um, and be in top shape. Physically, mentally, mm. emotion, all of that. Yeah. You've just got you gotta show up. You gotta show up prepared and ready. Right. And That's part of at the same time of being an actor. Yeah. Yes, you ha- it, it's it's your responsibility, it's your job. Yeah. I mean, I've just talked to somebody recently and they were operating a particular way and I said, you know, if I operated the way you're operating in this circumstance, uh, when I go to work I would be fired. Oh, my gosh. You said this. Yes. Yeah. I said it. Before we, I mean, we're fine on time, but I do want to get to this episode of, of this show that I so cherish. Mm. Um, <laughs> You're Shell so and Beck. sweet. <laughs> to Shell and Beck is just like, it was just one of the greatest highlights of the TV season. I mean, everyone I, and I have so many friends who feel similarly and all speak of transparent in that, in that way that you said of like, you feel it. And you certainly feel that they are your other family or that they are like your family, Mm -hmm. even if you are not Jewish, even if you do not have a transitioning parent. That's right. That it's all, it's a testament to the the whole, um, in the specific is the universal, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And so in season three. That's a great thing to say. Yeah. In season three, I think Shelley got much more specific, her story. 
mm-hmm. and her circum or we we learned about her backstory in I think very surprising ways for season for yes. a third season of a show. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I mean, first of all, did those learning about her backstory in those flashbacks did that how did that inform you and how did that change her in your mind or even change her performance? I mm, it didn't change the performance. Okay. I mean, I I so trust Jill Soloway and our writers that I and when I was in the process of first working on Shelley creating her and we were all working together, I I always knew there was something underneath. I had no name for it, but mm. I knew there was something because mm. the the I always said this about her, which was every way in which they wrote her was a road map mm. for me to see that this person wants so desperately to be connected and not to be she's one of the loneliest human beings. Oh. Right? Yeah. You feel that from I her. do think we feel that from the beginning. And yeah. I felt that mm. about her from the beginning. Mm. And she has absolutely no mechanism, no idea mm. how to connect. Mm. And so what she ends up doing is pushing everybody away. Right. Yeah. And so Ugh. what you see is this person at sea all of the time. Mm. Yeah. And trying desperately at the same time to hold on and find certainty in the world. And life is not certain. It's yeah. completely uncertain. And that's partly what we don't want to deal with. We don't want to deal with <laughs> the fact that we know we're going to die someday. Uh, certainly not that. Not that. <laughs> we're not going to look. We're <laughs> not looking at that. Anything but that. And so some part of Shelley died. When she was a young girl. Yeah. And she's never found her way back. And mm. it was Mort yeah. who she thought was going to save her. Right. Right. So right. And I think people respond to the to Shell and Back and the, the leaving of a boyfriend who is taking advantage of her that she has not been awake to. Again, a person who doesn't want to be alone, a person who has to be in a relationship, a person who can't stand to be by herself because what will she see? Mm. What will it, will that be a death in some way? Right. And there's this amazing book that won the Pulitzer Prize by Ernest Becker called uh, Denial of Death. And we, it's... Oh, it's about. Great. I read it when I was doing Wit. And mm. Wit is a play about a woman who's in fourth stage ovarian cancer, dying of ovarian mm-hmm. cancer, and mm-hmm. does indeed die in the play. And Herb said to me, you have to read this. And that's how we live. We go through the world without recognizing, and I've talked about this a lot too, but that's Carlos Castaneda said, with death on our shoulder. Mm. That, was the, that was the majesty of the LGBTQ community right. during the onset of AIDS. Mm. Living on your with shoulder. death yeah. on your shoulder every minute. How do you come to grips with that? How do you right. come how do you befriend that? How do you own that? How do you live differently because you know that? Mm. So hmm. here's Shelley in another terrible relationship. Mm-hmm. Not another terrible relationship, a relationship that doesn't work out. Mm. She chooses incorrectly out of her own need to desperation, to move on, right. to be taken care of, to have some kind of safety net, to protect to herself. Yeah. And then finding that out and realizing, and you'll notice, it's from a gay man on the boat who says to her, you can do this. Mm. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, he's, it's very key that he's a gay man. Too. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And that he unconditionally believes in her and that in his project. That is exactly right. Yeah. He just sees in her. That's right. Yeah. Whether she, She's almost like, what? <laughs> that's... Doesn't want anything from her. 
right. wants to, to support, support her. her. Absolutely, yeah. And well, and the genius of that episode too is that we, as an audience, I don't think we think that Shellen to Shellenbach is going to be this tour de force amazing breakthrough of a moment for her and of a performance. But that no. gay man who is portrayed in a funny way, he believes it. And so the, it's almost like a reveal at the end that There's, it's amazing. And that it is a person who has pushed down their voice, their real self for so long. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And because someone has believed in her, I mean, Buzzy All believed in her, but then he was ripping her off. Right. But this person yeah. so believes in her. And again, like you said before, so brilliantly, the specifics cr- inform the universal. Sure. The universal mm-hmm. informs the specifics. It all goes mm-hmm. back and forth. Mm. This is a person finding their voice again. Yeah. And how many of us have pushed it down, said that's not me, not told the truth, not said this is my real self for fear of what would happen? Whatever, yeah. Yeah. And this explosion Hmm. and this coming out Mm -hmm. and this glorious ownership of voice, yeah. of self, is what that's really about. Sure. We love the song. We love Alanis Morissette. Right. I mean, she's a <laughs> right. dream. The and song Shelley is amazing. And, and I said to Faith Soloway, Jill's sister, I said, mm. uh, why this song? <laughs> yeah, right. She said, we have an idea about it. She said, look at the lyrics, look at them, and we're going to do huh. it in a whole different way. Uh-huh. And uh-huh. they worked with me like crazy. I mean, we've just worked on it. And when we were on the on the ship, we just kept working on it, working on wow. it, working on it. And wow. Our Lady J, who is mm-hmm. one of our brilliant writers, and she also used to be a pit pianist for Broadway. Oh, cool. Okay. And so we worked on it. And Tom Link, who is this oh wonderful, generous, amazing actor, we worked on it together. And so, uh. and Jill and her sister Faith, Faith worked on this with me like crazy. And Marta Cunningham, who directed the episode. And But everybody was in in on it. And so what you're feeling mm-hmm. is Jim Frona, our extraordinary cinematographer who was up in my face. Oh, yeah. And in I so trust him. And he has, we've all done this work together where we're yeah. one family. And so Jimmy's my appendage. And then cool. Marta knows about the work. And then Jill is there. And Faith is there. And Our mm. Lady J is there. And Tom Lank is there. And all the people from the ship who were just people from the ship oh, cool. who came to be part of the show. That's who these people were. And they kept staying and supporting. And it was, <laughs> it was this... And of course, there's Jeffrey, who I've known for all these years. Yeah, and he's just. And listening. I'm looking out at him, and mm-hmm. I see him, and Amy, and Gabby, mm-hmm. and and the genius, the brilliance of Jay's character of Josh not being there. not being there mm-hmm. and being at the back mm-hmm. of the boat, dealing with actual go death of Rita, dealing with go- death on his shoulder. Exactly. Yeah. That's all of what you're feeling when you're seeing that. Mm-hmm. And it's almost like we are all opening our eyes to that. I love that you call it an explosion. Yeah. That is what it, it's fi- it's finding your voice when no one expected there needed to be a voice to be found or something. <laughs> That's right. Wow. And so many people have said to me, "Oh, Shelley drives me crazy." <laughs> they say that to and you. And I and I and I say, "Yes, of, of course. Mm-hmm. Of course she does. I understand that. She's our mom. She's <laughs> She's our mom. She's one of our moms. And she's one of our moms. And she's also a mom who doesn't take responsibility for what she does, doesn't try to make a difference. She's up in everybody's face. And, you know, it's like this is wrong or that's wrong or you don't do this or you don't do that. Or, you know, like when she takes all of Gabby's stuff, the stuff that she did in art class, and she just gives it away. Uh And it's like, Mom, that meant something to me. It's like, no, no, Buzzy says if you hold (laughs) an object in your hand and it doesn't give you joy, you have to get rid of it. It's like, she has an answer for everything. And it's like, people are like, oh, God. But I would rather 
them see it that way. Uh huh. And then come to understand her. Exactly. Yeah. Because everybody right. in your life is a projection of yourself. Mm -hmm. It's like there that is thing no, of there in a is dream. No, everything, everyone you meet in a dream is you. Everyone you meet in the dream is you. Totally. Exactly. Yeah. There is no other. There is no. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is the. There is no one else out there. We project all of our stuff on yeah. other people. Totally. And we've, then we look at someone like that. We look at Shelley and we say, look at how I have been viewing her. How have I been viewing myself? Mm. Yeah. What voice is there in me that I need to find? How can I find it? How can I come to love this being that is me? Mm. How? Can I then come to love and accept and understand everyone? And I think love is knowing all of what and taking in and allowing all of what someone is and all of what they're not. Mm. It's not some sort of new agey, I love you. Oh my God, <laughs> I love you. <laughs> right. No, no, there's an active yeah. aspect of this that's not new age it's very grounded in how we go through the world yeah um, and, and that's what's great about shows like transparent where I feel like we're I mean we're living in this quote-unquote golden golden age of television of peak prestige TV but it is true that for me watching shows like transparent is like it is a little bit of a mirror effect of like I learn more about myself watching um, that episode of uh, Man on the Land, oh. that and the burning of the books that's happening in that scene. Oh. I'm not Jewish. I'm not trans. I, but I, I learned more about myself watching that. Cool. And how rare is that in and storytelling and in How television? wonderful that you admit that, that you say that, you mm. speak to that. Mm. Because not everybody knows how to articulate that. Certainly not. In that way. Right, right. It's not... You find out about history, you find out about what happened, and there is mm. empathy and compassion mm -hmm. and understanding and education, and then the world gets elevated yeah. by your seeing that. For sure. And that, I think, is so much Jill's purpose. That's what she mm -hmm. talked about with me. She said, I want there to be a different culture. I want it to be safe, yeah. oh, a safe world for my parent. Wow. I want th this. We need to change our dialogues with each other. Mm -hmm. And Gosh. that's what she was doing. And I was like, I have to do this. Yeah. I well, want to do this. It seems like such a lofty goal, but and lofty and almost if you look at it most people hold it as futile because it seems so yeah. large. Uh -huh. But if you do it five little pfeffermans at a time. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're and you guys are making those baby steps, I think. Yeah. The impact of this show. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And we never take that for granted. My God. It's like, mm. are we being responsible? Are mm. we saying it the right way? Am I telling the truth in the ways I'm telling them so that whoever hears this with you and me has a, an experience that it is possible? Mm. It's only possible if you start making those steps. Mm -hmm. If If what... We're here to support each other in doing is not living in the things that are our made up belief system, our safety nets, mm. our what is our security. Like I was talking about Shelley before about having to have a man, can't mm -hmm. be alone, too hard. Mm. But if what we want more than anything is our freedom is to be free. Mm. I have friends who have said to me they were terrified to come out. Mm. I just got a letter from a friend, and I had encouraged him. We had another friend, a mutual friend, who was dying and who died about a year and a half ago. And he said to me, 
I, I, he was talking, and I said, you know, our friend would have wanted you mm. to come out to your mother. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I said, that would be your gift to him, but more to yourself. Sure. And he did. Mm. And his relationship with his mother is so gorgeous now. Oh, wow. He had projected all this stuff onto her that she would do this or mm-hmm. she would do that or they wouldn't be able to be close. I said, you can't be close. You're not giving her your true self. Mm. And and look, it doesn't always work out like that, as we no, know. I was going to say, yeah, the fear of rejection is is there because it's true that it That, that it, it happens. Yeah. But you're still free. Right. You're still free. Yes. And even if you suffer that pain. You've told yeah. your truth and mm. you can honor that and no longer mm. have to be a victim. And then you are free. That's what I say to young actors coming up. You are our legacy. Mm. You are our history. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Be, be responsible to this gift that has been given you. Yeah. create great beings Mm. that go out into the world, tell stories. Mm -hmm. We are storytellers. And there's a responsibility in that, but there's also a gratitude that has to come with that. Must. That's why Jill always says, we work in gratitude Mm -hmm. to this ability to do this work. There was a scene in season two Mm -hmm. that we did, uh, which was the the bathtub scene. Some people remember it. Some Mm. people don't remember it. It was where Maura and I had a sexual encounter in the Mm -hmm. bathtub. And before we started that, I was very very nervous. Jeffrey had been nervous. We shared a lot with each other. I shared that with Jill. Mm. There were four people in the room. It was Jimmy Frona, our cinematographer. It was Jill and Jeffrey and me. Mm -hmm. And before we started, Jill said, let's just hold hands. Let's just take a moment to connect. Oh, wow. Yeah. She had gotten rid of everybody out of the building because she knew she needed to make us. It was so intimate, and she wanted to make us have the experience of being safe. Mm. And usually there's somebody who has, there's a bubble machine that makes the bubbles for, for a bubble bath to cover oh, you and right. stuff like that. Uh-huh. And usually there's somebody there to put them. Jill came and put them on me gotcha. so that I was covered. Okay. And when we started, she said, I just want to take this moment for us to be in gratitude mm-hmm. that we get to do this. Sure. That we get to talk about mature people and their sexuality mm-hmm. and their gender fluidity yeah. and the beauty of that and mm. the fear in that and the tenderness in that and the poignancy in that. Mm-hmm. And we just stopped for a minute. And that's the kind of way that mm. she works with us. Yeah. And the kind of... In- Intimacy of conversation and connection. And Jimmy Frona, when we were shooting it, he's in the bathtub with Jeffrey and me. Yeah. I mean, there's a, a kind of way of working that I have never, I have never worked like this no. before, not in, not in this way. Right, and I, f- I find that so interesting that instead of, of taking that moment and being like, we are being groundbreaking or thinking about the optics of like, this is a, a, something that's not often represented in TV or mainstream or like, so that it's a responsibility in that way. No, it's more of just like, let it's us, beautiful. Let us Let's give it. Let us live in that. Let us live in that. Yeah. And let us be grateful that we have the ability to do this, and let it be received in the way that we want it. That exactly. we are giving it. That we hope it will be received. And yeah. I think that's why the moments like that and moments like To Shell and Back, we feel that as an audience because you guys have put that le- that level of. I don't even know what to call it, of of work into each of those scenes and of intimacy and of just raw, brave, go for it. But without that, we're going for it. It's more of just a, you, you we're telling you this beautiful story. You have articulated it perfectly. <laughs> you have. I mean, you really, you really have. It's exactly what it is, what it's, how it's meant to be given and shared. Yeah. yeah. And you mentioned earlier that it's educational in a way, and that's... 
Absolutely. I think as it should be. We need more TV like that. Right, but without being didactic. Right. Without and there's saying, nothing didactic. Uh, excuse me, uh, here's the lesson here. Right. See the arrow, the little yellow arrow that's pointing to the lesson? No, no. because that, that if will... If anything, transparent does it with humor. With Right. Yeah. And also, if you do that, you take people out of a moment. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you... you it's there, preachy it, and it becomes, yeah. Well, you don't... You don't it feel it. Like you watch it. or something. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but then you, like, you don't feel it. Yeah. You watch it. You go, ah, oh, I'm watching. In fact, answer. that's like brain and not gut. That, that's right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, 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 You get it. You absolutely get it. Yeah. This notion of rejection, of coming out or potentially coming out, I mean, is that, how is that related to being a working actor? We're backstage, of course, so yes, we want to know. Yes, of course, we must. In terms we... of the audition advice, um, how do you, is that true that that you have to overcome your fear of the rejection and sort of come out and overcome the blockages in your life in order to book a job or in order to pick yourself up after you don't book a job? You're there to solve their problem. Uh huh. It's about them. You walk into that room. It's not about you. Oh, it's about them. Cool. It's about them. Yeah. It's like you're in a service business. Mm-hmm. Make it about them. I know Mm. that you need to have your problem solved, and I'm here to solve your problem. You Mm -hmm. need to cast this. Mm. And I want you to get from my energy that Mm -hmm. I'm a team player. Yeah. Oh, certainly. That I love it, that I love this. Yeah. I'm getting to act, which is a great joy for me. Yes, certainly. And whether... Look, we all want approval. We all come into this wanting approval. Yeah. But that's, in some ways, the child aspect of the business. One has to become a grown-up. One has to grow up. Mm-hmm. People say they want to grow they, they say they want to grow up, but they don't want to do what has to be done in order to become a grown-up. Mm-hmm. So it's not about the rejection. It, they're not... It's, it's not about you. It, taking it personally is so easy for us to do. Mm-hmm. And it's not... Because you're the violin and the violin player, like you said. Well, ex- <laughs> that's right. You, but you don't you, like my violin? Right. It's like there's something... One of the things that I had to really work on was letting go of control. Mm. And knowing that not... Just allowing fate. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about Mm. that new age. Oh, whatever's to come to me. And oh, if I vision this or if I Mm. do affirmations and all of that stuff. No, no, no. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about working hard, Mm -hmm. being disciplined, being disciplined about your own psychology, understanding your own psychology, knowing your own psychology, Mm. how you interact with people, and knowing that there is something else in the world beside you Mm. that if you hold the universe as a place of good, mm-hmm. it is always a place of good for you. Whether you get the job or don't get the job, there's always an experience to be learned. Mm-hmm. There's always a way to go back without beating yourself up and saying, oh, I see. I could have done that. That would have been valuable. I'll learn that for the next time. Mm. But if you sit there and beat yourself up and say, I'm not good enough or they didn't like me, there the will be head st- stuff. Yeah. There will be something else that will come along yeah. Yeah. that will guide you, that will, if you're listening, if you're watching, if you're, totally. if you're about doing something that is of service in the world, and it may be that you get so many rejections that at a certain point you say, you know what, I don't think this is for me. I think there's, there's another, another way for me to be in the world. Another path, yeah. There's another path. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. Right, and it's, it's about... Like, you got to be able to hear that. And... There's an allowance and a humility mm-hmm. and a um, allowing yourself to be guided while at the same time working diligently. Mm. You have to do both. It requires both. You cannot just say, I leave it to the universe mm-hmm. to guide me and give me things. No, you got to work your ass off. Totally. It's like there are two things. And so you have to let go of control. And if you beat yourself mm. up, if you don't get something, it's antithetical to the process. Mm. It's It serves you. It, 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 it serves you not at all. Yeah. The idea is to keep learning, yeah. to keep growing, 
to also one of the other things that I find is, and I say this to to all young actors all the time, you're going to walk into an audition and you're going to see all these people you know. Yeah. Get away from them. <laughs> okay. Go into another space. Do your thing. Yeah. Oh, own yourself. Own your space. Get away. Yeah. There is that constant, insidious conversation that we all have with each other, and we try to be on top of it. And it's like, mm. how long was that person in the room? And how totally. uh, you're listening to them? Maybe I should change my audition and what Oof. I was thinking I was going to do. It's like, that no, you've got to get away from them. And the listening to other actors about what jobs they got or what you know what other thing they were they're planning on doing or where they're going or any of that it's like oh did you get up for this did your mm, agent send you up for this totally. oh did you read about this in backstage and are you going up for stop those yeah. conversations yeah. read backstage it's fabulous <laughs> look you. at the audition yeah, yeah. decide you're going to go up for it and, and work on do that it. job yeah it's not d don't diminish your power and mm -hmm. and I think that ownership of that and taking responsibility for who you are as a person as a being right. and as an artist yeah yeah and don't do things that embellish that mm. aspect of you do not do things that diminish you yeah and don't listen to the voices in your head there are voices in your head like is she good enough? Uh, oh, those kinds of those yeah, kinds the of the, and the or uh, oh my God, mm, he was so good when he was little. I mean, he is meant to be in this business. It's like identify whose voice that is, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and acknowledge that they're there. That that's diminishing. They mean to do you. They mean to be supportive. Yeah, you mm -hmm. can say your voice right now is not supportive to me. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you I'm for sharing. <laughs> thank you for sharing. I'm going. I'm going another. I'm going another way. Right. Remember, this is a business of being of service. Yeah, you that's are so to be of service to everyone you meet. Yeah. That means you love the press. That means you yeah. love the person who's who's interviewing you. Because, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, and I've said this over and over again, you are my voice out there. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. are my voice. Yeah. Give deference and respect to everyone and be a team player. That's Contrary so to popular yeah. belief, this is not about you. I know you got into this business right. because you thought it was going to be about you. <laughs> right. And the exact opposite is yeah. true. Yeah. It is not about you. It is about your audience. It is about what you can give. It is about the whole team, not about you. And sometimes it's about changing the world. And, some, and that's the service you're providing. And sometimes it is like what Jill Soloway says. Yeah. We are here to change the conversation and the culture. And in pr the process of doing that, we might even change the world. Amazing. Well, I have interviewed a lot of people about acting, and I feel like I have learned a lot about acting in this interview. Thank you. Especially this idea of service, that it all comes back to it's not about you. It's not about you at all. But, but work on yourself, and of course, being and do the work that a fully you're... cultivated person is going to lead to these fully culti cultivated characters, and that's and that's the point. You, right. you just it's like this is not easy. Mm -mm. This is not comfortable. This is a very complicated, challenging job, and right. to stay on top of it, and it gets even more complicated the more successful you become. Everybody thinks, "Oh my sure. God, if I just get that limousine and those sunglasses, I'd be <laughs> fine." And it's like, <laughs> and you have to distinguish whether you want to be a working actor. Do you want to be a star? Do you want to be both? Do you, yeah. you can be both. Yeah, yeah. But a lot of people want to go into this because they want to be paid attention to. Yeah, you know, and <laughs> that's not what this is about. No. This is not about that. This is about the honor and the gratitude mm. of creating another human being out of your own flesh and blood. Yeah, yeah. You, this is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> you are that. smart. This episode is brought to you by HBO's original film, Wizard of Lies. Starring Robert De Niro and Michelle Pfeiffer as Bernie and Ruth Madoff, this HBO film's production examines Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme. 
Newsday writes, the acting is impeccable and the direction scalpel sharp for your Emmy consideration in outstanding television movie and all other categories. Catherine Hahn got her big break in the NBC crime drama Crossing Jordan before going on to star in a number of film and TV shows, everything from Captain Fantastic to Parks and Recreation. She is now Emmy-nominated for her role in Amazon's Transparent, while also starring in Jill Soloway's other Amazon comedy, I Love Dick. She's a wonderful actress and a wise and hilarious person. Here it is, our interview with Katherine Hahn. Congratulations are on your Emmy nomination. Thank you. You said you were not expecting it at all. No. Like you you weren't doing that thing of like, oh, I just I had no idea. I just happened to be You know, I knew that there was like a con there was like a I was in conversation for the first time that I had but I thought it was for mm. Dick, honestly. Uh-huh. Like and so we were I just figured I this this was the rabbi was a complete <sighs> Complete surprise. We cool. knew it was a long shot anywhere, but I just knew it was kind uh-huh. of like in, like, but uh, for anything. But this was a real, real surprise. Yeah. Terribly well, and exciting. I've spoken to both Jay Duplass and Judith Light, mm. and they have both said that promoting Transparent, especially on the awards circuit, is really kind of an opportunity. It's activism. Like, it's an opportunity to push forward a, a message. It, exa- that's exactly what it feels like. It yeah. does. It doesn't feel, like, dirty in that way because you just feel right. proud that you're— uh, actually giving voice to to people and stories that need to be told and heard. Yeah, yeah, because representation for sure. matters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, I, it all it also feels because I love this group of humans so deeply. Mm. Uh, it just it feels unabashedly honest just to just to gush about them as performers mm. and humans. We'll do that. We're going to gush about them. Good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> when did you know that you wanted to be an actor? I'm going to just dive right in. Oh my god, I love it. I grew up in Ohio, in Cleveland, um, uh, Cleveland Heights, to be exact. And I was always suburb. Is that small town? Suburb Uh of of Cleveland. It's on the east side, or the east side. My mom always said she wanted the east side. My mom wanted to start a bakery called the East Side Bakery. (laughs) She was horrible. She was always. It was a huge (laughs) regret that never came to fruition. Um, Because I thought it was a charming name for a bakery. Uh, but yeah, I always was like a deep, deep into pretend, I guess. Like I was yeah. always, uh, always like, uh, you know, we lived kind of close to the Amish. I was obsessed with the Amish. Oh my gosh. Really? Obsessed. How interesting. Like first crushes. <laughs> yeah. Like it was like. Just like as a as Gender a culture, switching like witness. As a I was like, yes. I was Harrison Ford like peeking in. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> just to worship them. Yeah, cool. And so I would literally ask my mom if we could do like homework by candlelight. Like oh, I was really, but yeah. I would just go like I would go into like a fugue state from getting home from school until dinner time, and then go right back Whoa. in again. Like I was yeah, like yeah. deep, deep pretend. Cool. So I kind of knew it pretty early on. Like I'm in mean, pretty early on. I was a curtain puller at the Cleveland Playhouse, and yeah, there's something about that space and the Tony uh, winning actors. Cleveland Playhouse. Yeah, they're I know. so legit. Yeah, I know. It's amazing. And but when back back when I was. Uh, a kid there, there, there was still a, still like a legit rep company that was just a bunch of, oh. you know, actors from Cleveland that would, you know, take on a, gaz- you know, favorites. it was like what we think of when we think of a rep company. Yeah. And now before they started like casting people from New York, gotcha. but I grew up knowing like these, th- they were my rock stars was this like group cool. of 12 actors. You got to see them do a gazillion yeah. different parts. And, I know that feeling. Yeah. yeah. That local company. Yeah. And so was it Broadway? Was it, was that like the site set on? For me, yeah. yeah. Oh God, I don't even think I. On, I don't even think I like even Cleveland could think Playhouse. that big. Yeah, it was like Cleveland Playhouse. It was like regional sure. theater. It was like just doing. It was all. I never even. You know, I mean, it, that would have been a dream. I, I, yeah, I couldn't. Of course, I mean, Broadway would be. Yeah, Still, at that yeah, point, of course. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I did one Broadway play, mm-hmm. which was pretty amazing, and I haven't been able to since because i'm a mama but i yeah it was the the, <laughs> the highlight of my life for sure but you it's it, always theater always theater. It, it was so at what point did it become on camera stuff 
Like, how do you? Did I mean, you fall all yeah, that? always theater. It was like Williams. I got to New York. It was Williamstown. It was mm-hmm. like I went to for, well, first I went to Northwestern. Uh, then when I got to New York, I was like a receptionist in a hair salon. Yes. And then you know, uh, I'd wake in li- I would wait in line for the backstage I like every Wednesday. Say, backstage. Uh huh. We would laugh. We would always joke about the no pay nudity ads in the back oh. for movies. <laughs> Be like, oh, I can't wait to stand in line in the cold. <laughs> and then um, <laughs> uh, got a bunch of work. The, my first. My Did you book gigs? Yeah. Through yeah. Backstage? That's great. I had like uh, theater for, oh, what's that one? It was like on Avenue A or B. Oh. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. Theater for New City? Is it Theater for New Audience? Or um, One is like Theater for New City or Theater for I New know Audience. I which one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe it was Theater for New Audience. But it was like I did a couple plays there. Yeah. Uh, again, no pay, like non-union, but whatever. It felt but awesome. Getting, this, getting the chops. And it felt awesome, yeah. I loved it. Great. Yeah. What kind of, is it dramas were you doing? I was doing mostly mostly dramas, yeah. Any, like, leading roles? I guess, this like, all... I mean, no, not in New York. I don't, uh, you know, I started to when we were at Williamstown. I did maybe, like, nine years. Yeah. Like, seven or nine years. Honey, it's a blur. <sighs> At Williamstown, like started there as a non act. They turned me equity. Amazing. That's um, the thing that Williamstown does. They just the pump best. stars out oh, of there. Oh, it was like, I mean, I just couldn't. It was the best, the best, the best. Yeah. I was there uh, when Michael Ritchie was there as cool. the artistic director and Nikki Martin. I don't know if you remember the late, great Nikki Martin. He was an amazing theater director and his production of Hedda Gabler starring Kate Burton. Uh huh. Wow. Was the show that turned me equity. I was playing Bear to the Maid. Amazing. Probably yeah. the world's youngest. Ah. Bear to. Uh huh. There's a lot of like, I remember Torvald and was like, do you? Because Torvald's <laughs> twice your age. <laughs> right. <laughs> Played by the amazing. But you're going to. Michael Emerson. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. It was an amazing cast. Wow. And that yeah. was how you got your equity card. And that's how I got. Yeah, yeah that's how I became a. Oh, Sav, I keep saying SAG. That's hilarious. Uh, oh, right. right. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, my God. Times have changed. <laughs> but then, yeah. yeah, how did equity, you then. Equity, equity, equity. What was then the. Was it TV? Was it. I mean, no, I think I. I mean, then I went to. I was. So Indie I did film. a ton of Williamstown. Ton of Williamstown. Went to grad school at Yale. You know, put myself through it. Right. Just because, as satisfying as some of those gigs <laughs> that I was doing. After working a shift at a hair salon were, yeah. it was not, I w- thought to have like a rigorous three years that I didn't have to worry. I, I knew it wasn't going to be like a life changer career wise, but I mm. um, uh, just wanted to, I just wanted to work. So, you know, it was awesome. I just accrued a shit ton of debt and then I just yeah, was able to. I was going to ask. Oh my God. Yeah. Crazy. It, my friend Darren and I, every time we got a piece of pizza, we were like, this is eventually going to be $25. This piece of pizza after. Yeah. Um, but then I worked. Um, yeah, then then uh, I so it was the best to have three years of doing, you know, rehearsing for Hamlet one in the morning. And yeah. I was always a class clown, but I was always kind of cast as more serious, I guess. Oh, interesting. I don't know. I don't know. Mm. But maybe that's not true. It was like grandma and grapes of wrath. Uh huh. OK. <laughs> but you were the class clown. Yeah, we had a, we had our sense. whole class was a bunch of like just awesome ragamuffins. Uh huh. I think that's interesting though that you would be cast for serious. Like I feel like that is true of Transparent and of I Love Dick. You're like a yeah, very, it's very interesting. Funny it's person. like I'm going back to. It's like Jill found something mm, in me. Yeah. Or saw something in me that I hadn't been totally. asked to do on camera. Yeah. But had been like in my deep my deep roots. Yeah. For sure. And to be a class clown, I mean, clowning itself is the reason it's important for actors to learn that aspect of training is because yeah. that's like a fundamental thing that you can then build a character on top of. Yeah. And I think it's like a we, you know, I grew up in a family of real, it was a real tough room, very funny, very oh, tough yeah. room. Like That's like, training right there. Everybody was tough. Like you had to keep up and have uh, a little bit of a thick skin for mm-hmm, sure. Interesting. And um uh, so I think that was always like my defense was like comedy, comedy, and defense. You know what I mean? Whoa! And um, I should we should have had Judith and you interview each other. I know. Just and then we would just start magic. sobbing. Yeah, I know. There'd be a lot of tears too. <laughs> so many tears and so much of me just being like, "Can I smell you?" She, <laughs> she smells smell you. so good. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I think that's. And then after Yale, mm-hmm. I my last year there, I got like a. Um, holding deal, which was yeah. great because of 
my debt. <laughs> Because I, I still owed undergrad too. Like it was a oh, wow. tremendous yeah. amount of money Crazy. that I was owing, that I owed. And so that. Did the survival jobs continue after grad school? No, I got that. I got a television show that was supposed to be just a few episodes. It was called Crossing Jordan. And yep. that was, it was just supposed to be a Crossing I didn't Jordan. Realize that was right after. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was like the summer. Or after. during. Yeah, yeah. And then I went out to, that's what moved, that's what I moved out to LA for. Gotcha. And then I kind of and denied that I was out here for or living out here for a really long time. Okay, yeah. My then boyfriend, now hubby, and I had a storage locker in Brooklyn that we had for so long. Oh, okay. Because you were sort of because I was like a little bit. We were like we're not really living okay. out in LA. Yeah. And then when we finally were like, this is such a waste of money, and we decided to like <laughs> have it shipped out here, the contents of the storage unit, it was yeah. like hilarious. What we deemed store worthy, it was like. It like, of tights. It like all arrives and you're like, oh. Yeah, it's like a huge microwave. This was tying me to the East Coast, really. Like, yeah, yeah, a salad spinner. I totally get that. <laughs> from right. opening, opening my first yeah. savings account. Uh-huh. Yeah, so anyway, it was, that was, a, it was kind of fascinating. The but clutter. yeah, I'm into L.A., I'm telling you. Good, yeah. Yeah, I miss New York madly, and it's always, I, uh-huh. I, I love whenever I go back, but there is something about this. Also, I think it's maybe finding a creative home with that feels like as deep as anywhere else, like in Soloway's land, that has really say, helped yeah. make it feel like That's juicier. Your community. Yeah. yeah. It is almost like a, a rep company exactly. at a regional theater. Exactly. Um, going back to the uh, quote unquote survival jobs. Yeah. Yeah. That attitude of like being the receptionist and and rehearsing and performing for mm. no little to no money. Like, what is the attitude behind that? Like, do you relish the survival <sighs> job as well, or do you kind of switch between? I'm at my day job and now I'm doing the work and that's the exciting part. Oh like, gosh. How do I mean, actors in that position and there are plenty All like, of us, what right? Is your, do, totally. very, it's very rare that anybody starts out in a different Exactly. I mean I, I and I did it for years. I mean I didn't really start getting paid until I was on my in my thirties, to be honest. Yeah, when, when what you're saying about the debt is that's so common and that's uh, not talked about very often. And oh, it's, it's like real. it's like med school. Like it's some yeah. so what some of these grad schools are asking. I, I And you it went to grad crazy. school with undergrad debt. <laughs> With undergrad debt. I know. <laughs> I was like a real, like, my parents were like, la, 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 like, uh, you're on your own. Right. Um, and hence the survival jobs. It was intense. I mean, I yeah. guess it is like a, you must have, one must have a crazy belief in themselves. <laughs> right. Because otherwise, like, do. what are you, what are you doing? It's like, it's insane. Right. But, uh, or just, and even if it's not belief in yourself, because I wouldn't consider myself like most confident human on, on the planet, but I, I would say there is, there was nothing else, nothing else that I w- yeah. could imagine myself doing. There's no plan doing. B for you. There was l- never a plan B. I could never imagine anything else. I didn't know how it was going to happen. I didn't yeah. know what it was going to look like. I didn't know uh, any of it, but I knew that there was never a plan B. Yeah. Amazing. So to answer your question about the day job stuff, like, I mean, no, I mean, I, I worked at a hair salon mm-hmm. in New York called Garen, New York, which is very fancy. I don't know if you remember this, but it was it was in Henry Bendel. Okay. Or Henry Bendel. Uh-huh. Not sure how to pronounce it. Henri Bendel. <laughs> <laughs> but it was very fancy. <laughs> we would have to, like, it was in the days of, like, I remember we'd have to, like, sometimes, like, open up early because, like, Carolyn Bissette would come in to get her gotcha. chunky highlights. Like, okay. it was fancy. Okay. He did, like, Linda Evangelista. Uh-huh. He did, like, the Mark, you know... Sandra Bernhard, like all yeah. these amazing, so like amazing yeah. humans would come in. Cool. And I had like my one Banana Republic black suit that was like shiny because I had to dry clean it so many oh. times. Oh, wow. That I wore. I was like the receptionist. All the guys got together. Just and the one suit. <laughs> one suit. Really? Shiny. Really? Sometimes with a toothpaste roll. <laughs> and all the guys together for one holiday oh. got together and got me a Mason Pearson hairbrush because they were like, brush your hair. Huh? Oh, no. <laughs> 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 but like, times have not, obviously times have not changed. <laughs> so um, your hair is beautiful. <laughs> thanks. It's really it's unkempt. Yeah, but it, but it, it is. Works. It's just what happens. Yeah. Um, but my uh, uh, yeah. So of course I had like a I I had a, a love hate relationship with. I was very grateful for the gig, of right. course, to ha- to be able to make some sort of money. But it was mm. keeping me from what I wanted to do. Yeah. And, and like you said, if there's no plan B, then you're not going to pursue a plan B for that day job. No. And I also didn't want to like... It's not to be a receptionist. I didn't want to... You know, a lot of... There's a lot of actors that go the like background artist route yeah. or they go like... And for some sure. reason, that would have... That was just was making me feel depressed. Like I didn't want to like oh, okay. see it from afar. Mm. 
like I couldn't find yeah. my my joy in. So I and I Which is also why you're doing plays. Also, but you know what? Camera was never that interesting to me. Like I just okay. wanted to do plays. Oh, cool. Yeah. How interesting. I don't know. That now you're here. You've I know. moved because of Crossing Jordan, and here you are. Crojo. Cro- An Emmy nominee. <laughs> Oh, Crojo. Crojo. Wait, so after Crojo, I mean, you've worked plenty, but I want to focus on Jill yeah. because it's it really does seem like in your career and maybe even in your in your life, in your personal life, that meeting her was a huge just kind of turning point for you. I'm for sure. I mean, I had just, you know, it was it was perfect timing because I'd also just had my um, I was a pretty new mama. Mm-hmm. Um, I had two. My kids were really little at that time. Which does do something, I don't know, I was like much less self-conscious, I think, after having kids, or there was just cool. a bigger sense of, f*** it, pardon my French. No, that's... Flag it. I'm... Flag it. Flag Jamie. it. The flag Jamie, flag Hans. it. Hans obscenity. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can Strike start. one. <laughs> no, just, just a little note. <sighs> How about it? Just a little lack of respect to that word, flag no. it. No. <laughs> But um, there, there was. I think that she had seen me at a farmers. Uh, the you know, she says she saw me at the Silver Lake Farmers Market, which is at a farmers like market from afar. Oh, and ne- didn't say anything. And then she had seen me in Hung. I was doing. I had like an uh-huh. arc on Hung as like a very pregnant woman that like yes, ha- uh, you know, called on the services of a a beautiful Thomas Jane <laughs> yes. to work it out for her and. Um, uh, I think it was like that one two combo that she had just gotten her craw for her first feature afternoon delight and yeah. so that was uh yeah um a life changer for sure on not just career wise yeah. but just as a perf- as a as a creator wow. as, as a creative person and for those who don't know she works in a very specific way on set yes how did that compare to your previous experiences on sets well you know, it's interesting that you keep bringing up the on the like rep company or the yeah. the idea of like what it's where it, like all those all those feelings, those like deep feelings that I had of like being on a empty stage with a ghost lamp and a bunch of like sweaty mm. barefooted actors, like mm. those that like making something out of nothing feeling. That's why I got into this in the first place. That that feeling of ensemble and listening. Yeah. And safety is hmm. so it is what sh- what her sets are. Yeah. So it is common sense to me. Like it is really not like anything different than what it should be. <laughs> yeah. Like it's what it's, it should be. Yeah. It's so just. Uh, it's just the most beautiful feeling. I'm sure Judith has like said the same. And Jay, like it's this this beautiful feeling of of. Of ensemble and safety, and you feel like you are discovering it together. You don't feel like you have to get something right. That's mm. the difference, I think, between that and other sets. Is like, and most other sets, you feel, or I, I don't. know, My experience has been, mm-hmm. and this is not like always. There's some. Um, there are amazing, amazing people out there, but there, there, there is a sense of stand on your mark. You rehearse the scene once, yeah. you, they p- throw down marks on the ground and then you kind of spend the rest of the day trying to achieve something within those parameters mm. again, yeah. either to feel it again or something new, but within that, those limitations that have been set mm. and that works. Right. You know what I mean? That totally works. It's that's worked historically common. forever. Yeah, right. exactly. But there is, it's just, so this is just a different way of doing it where yeah. the marks, if they're thrown down, it's only after a, a lot of investigation on camera already. Sometimes. Gotcha. Um, huh. Sometimes you, they start in on a close up and then get wider. Like there's, so there's different ways of, of doing it uh, that just, I don't. It, I, I. It just to me. It's just about giving the actor a, the autonomy that they deserve, and that you would. Mm. I would assume want as a director um, right. or producer of content to. You would want your performer to feel as confident and autonomous as they possibly can. Sure. And you know? when you say investigate, does that mean improvisation, like f- official? Yeah, improv- or just like maybe and... not always. Like you know, we improvise a bunch, but not. 
not whole let me just say like dialogue. let me just say this if you're go- if you're doing if you're in the middle of a scene and you're like down that rabbit hole with somebody mm. and something is come you never feel like you're editing yourself if it takes another turn right and you know that the person is okay with those rules those like non rules rules that you're with <laughs> so you can huh. you can o- crack it open if you're not I- in ways that you can't possibly anticipate so if that makes any sure. sense so it doesn't mean that we just throw the script away and start from nowhere but right. If if you are in the middle of a scene, you don't want to uh, deny something that's happening. So you just yeah. are open to I it. I love that down the rabbit hole idea. It seems yeah. like that's all about that idea of safety in the, in the community and this family that yes. you guys have. That's all about listening, right? And like yes. feeding off of your scene partner. Yes. And being inspired by and, them. Yes, exactly. And yeah. also that there is you can sometimes assume a tone that is not necessarily helpful like so that there is something if you think a scene is strictly like like some scenes you think tone wise Mm -hmm. you're supposed to like okay what what are we trying to achieve here in Mm -hmm. this like you think it's one thing and if you really keep open you can realize that that something else is actually in in that scene that's not you know maybe Mm -hmm. as funny as you thought or actually it is funny and you didn't think it was going to be or so that is also that kind of discovery can happen too, and yeah. that's within the same lines. Like just, just yeah. it's just like staying open, and like you said, it's m- mostly listening. Like that's most of our job, right? And in a show an that's actor. that's both comedy and drama, like in, yes. you guys are in the dramedy kind of yes. shades of gray. Yes, I feel like there are different ways to play a scene where some lines can be jokes that are laugh out loud funny, yes. and some lines are much more focused and much more intense. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, exactly. And a lot of your stuff, especially for season three, mm-hmm. was very intense and serious. Yeah, yeah. I feel like, yes, yeah. Yeah, right, exactly. The wreckage of <laughs> a miscarriage. Jay, both of you. Yeah. There's a season of this character mm. recovering from a miscarriage. Yeah. And trying and losing her faith. Like it was, a, you know, yeah. for a rabbi, it was, it's a crisis mm. of faith. And to be, you know, the, I think the theme of the whole um, season three for everybody, for Shelley, for ev- for everyone, mm. um, Ali, Sarah, Mora, certainly. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, you've made it through the, de- you've made it to the desert. Now what? Yeah. So like you kind of finally, you finally feel like you're, if I have arrived somewhere, but now yeah, who am I? And uh, so everyone is kind of asking, who am I? And uh, I, I certainly just think for the, for the rabbi. Yeah, that is, she was, her, everything was shattered. Mm-hmm. She's mad. Mad. She's mad. Yeah, She's mad. Totally. Mad at God. Mad I at feel like herself. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. At her body. And her at body and Josh. And her, exactly. And at... Time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yet she's a rabbi. And so this, uh, yeah, mm-hmm. a Pfefferman walks, you know, knocks on her door, Sarah, who she knows is trouble. Yeah. Beautiful trouble. Yeah. And she can't, t- that person is on a journey as well. And so right. as a rabbi, you can't close your no. heart to that. No. <laughs> So Gosh. she lets her in. Like remembering the many conflicts that she's going through trying to like appease Sarah and Ugh. humor her, but like, you know, and hold her hand because it is her job, but she really doesn't want to. Well, and she knows that. I mean, she's she, kind of miserable. Miserable because yeah. she's in this horrible, like she knows that, that Sarah is on a journey. Yeah. She trusts she's on a journey, but she knows she also is aware and smart enough to know that that journey is very superficial at the moment. Uh Like she thinks that if she slaps together like a really great Pinterest worthy (laughs) (laughs) taco night, like she's going to right, right. She's going to she's going to, you know, find God. Right. With the bamboo plates and the perfect like everything's real bio. You know, what is it called? Bio Degradable. degradable. Thank you. Right. Um. You know, it's all she'll thing. find God. And so I think the, the inside, there is definitely a storm starting to brew in Raquel yeah. when that's all going down. Yeah, and it definitely comes to a head yes. at one specific scene. Which is so satisfying. <laughs> is so, it satisfying to do that? Oh, my gosh. Yes. Oh, my goodness. I could. I was so excited when I read that. Like I was volcano. like, oh, because I'd felt it for so, like the rabbi had felt uh, it for so, so long. Interesting. It's yes. so long. Even season two, like from the beginning, there Whoa. is like a, a part of her that had wanted to just. Just fury. Just to like, you just, you know, it's the same thing. Like, I you know, I have two little kids and uh-huh. sometimes you see 
I hope this doesn't sound horrible. Like sometimes you see a friend of theirs or a kid that just who's who just has just has no obviously like has not been told no yeah. in any way and yeah. there's no boundaries and you just know if that kid just got a smack on the butt they would be like <laughs> yes. just you just want to take him and know this not my job not my job obviously would never do that but there is a feeling of like just like you are not the most special human being on the planet like yeah. get your shit together like this yes. is or just you want to take them and. Uh, yes. And I just feel like there is that I have feel like a weird parenting need with Sarah, with Sarah. especially in this moment where I want to just smack her across the face and be like, wake up. Stop it. Stop it. Yeah. Just take a breath and look and just look yeah. inside. I and keep thinking, they have a hard time. Of course. The and Amy Landecker is a so, national treasure. Such a national. I think she's, she's such a goddess genius. as well. Oh, my God. Me too. And Throughout to play with her. Like, I was show. so excited that I was able to, like, do this path yeah, like a, yeah. with her in season well, three. Well, the thing that I keep thinking is, for us as an audience, her that journey that you're talking about that she's going through is hilarious. Yeah, I like, know. A lot of it is really, really funny. Yes. But not for Rabbi Raquel, ever. <laughs> no, it's... <laughs> Sarah's journey is classic and it will only get messier and messier and it should be. But right, yes, right. for the rabbi, it certainly was. You can't enjoy that aspect Well, I of felt the like comedy. I was kind of being dragged into the talk about the rabbit hole. Like I'm, I just mm. felt like the rabbi was kind of being dragged into this drama. Yeah, yeah. Where I'm trying to he- still heal myself right. and so that was uh i think it was that tension that was building and like you know you can't quit those fefferments like i would say you just can't do it they're just yeah. so goddamn charismatic and i feel like there is um and special yeah and you know sarah's a unconsciously or consciously a, a, a still connection to uh josh right you know I mean, there's such unfinished business there uh, tell me she about loves it. him so madly and yeah. he loves her well and that's why the one one time that you guys interacted all season was it just in that one episode? Mm-hmm. I, I could barely, uh, I could barely handle it. I could I barely know. watch. I know. There's I so know. much going on between those two characters. I know. It's crazy. I know. This show, I think, is so good about like sort of what you were saying earlier about. There's no. You get to the desert. There's no like point at which you have transitioned and I've you are arrived. now perfect. Right. And that show gets that. Really, like, Transparent could conceivably just go on and on and on because there's no... Everyone's trying to maybe better... Them. I don't know if they're actively trying to better themselves, but everyone's trying to find themselves. Find themselves, right. And that's not a process that you just... Oh, I no. woke up one morning and I'm healed. That was such a discovery for me, too, about Judaism is that it is... Because mm-hmm. I was brought up Catholic myself. I'm a re- recovering. Mm-hmm. But um, there... But there... The... What struck me about Judaism, knowing, you know, walking into this was that it is so much about just questions, questions, yeah. questions, questions, like not necessarily even needing an answer. But that idea of like of uh, uh, that idea of like a of a of a journey, like a true hmm. journey to find oneself and one's reason or and place. And, and so, yeah, all these all these humans in this show, I agree. And it sort of sounds like Jill's philosophy on set reflects that, that mm. what you were saying about it doesn't need to be a final, pro- like you guys are experimenting and you, mm-hmm. it's anything goes. Yeah. You're not, oh, we're working up to this point and now we did that scene perfectly. Like that's not true for actors on camera. No, I mean, it's and that's not to say exactly to clarify, like that's that isn't to say that there isn't like a better take than. Right. Yeah. And that one around the corner, like, or that there isn't, that there isn't like a real structured and specific, like emotional goalposts for people to try to hit through a season. Like we know, they know, they, yes, of course, there's something, there's a tether. Hmm. So we don't feel like it's just like emotional chaos. Like we know as actors, like our, our, you know, our, our actor and, and creator intelligence knows where we're headed like knows where ultimately we're supposed to go through a scene through a episode through a Mm. season wow yeah but it's within that that that's where the discovery can happen but that is yeah that is pretty rooted in i would say i I would think everyone would say the same thing and how miraculous that you said that you sensed the character's rage was building inside of her or inside of you? Know. I don't know which. I both. know. Isn't that? I know. <laughs> but then you get the script with the with the her mental breakdown. It's. I've never. And is that just just it's, just always yes. like? I mean, I experienced that. I did experience that feeling a little bit on 
Parks and Rec too, where yeah. you those writers know you so they just know your character's voice so well that it just you read it and you're like there is no it's like a channeling and that it mm. feels it feels like this uh, on transparent as well too they just know these people like you just giggle in anticipation because you know yeah. like for Shelley like I just know that woman so well that Judith yeah. I, I, I Judith lights I, sorry as I bang I just know her <laughs> so well that you just giggle like before you even. Yeah, you just see her face, her and face. you start to because you know exactly what she's totally. going to say, and that she's going to it's still going to surprise you, and but you know mm. that. So yeah, it is a crazy feeling that that careful building is not accidental, right? Like they know, but it's not. How do I describe this? I'm trying to describe this in a way, Jack. That it's like a because they 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 are also such incredible listeners. They meaning these writers, right? So they have listened to these people that are playing these parts mm. and to these characters, and because they are open to them, mm. there it doesn't feel over. It's not overthought. Like there's not a bunch of people, you know, with their ugh, like you a know. like a sitcom. Like oh, let's what if we set up this storyline right. for this person at it's all? It like, just flows yeah. because everybody is com- mm. communicating and yeah. listening and kind of listening to like where where does this character? It's almost like a where does this character want to end up? Yes. Like, what do they want to? Does Rabbi Raquel have a ton of rage inside of her that needs to be vented out in one explosive I speech? I know. <laughs> I know. And that, and it's like, of course, it's so perfect. You see, I mean, what? How else could that? You knew it was headed somewhere. I mean, I just knew as yes. soon as I opened that door to Sarah, I was like, uh oh. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but again, for the audience. I think maybe even the very beginning of your outburst was still funny. Like, it was still funny that Sarah, <laughs> Amy Landecker is, like, killing me in the scene. But then it gets so real. And you're just, like, and they're realizing that you're radioactive and they're actually, like, stepping yeah. away from you as you're just breaking all the way down. Oh, my God. And that, that amazing uh, man who played that Kobe, who played uh, Duvid the Cantor, who's... Uh-huh. Amazing, yeah, too. so great. He was such an amazing, earnest find, those eyes. He made me laugh so hard. He was fan- he was fantastic. How many times did you do that scene? Oh, it was a lot. Like a, how many times did you do a yelly scene? I'm always curious about it. Sometimes you get it really fast, and then yeah. sometimes because uh, I think it was because there was like more than a couple bodies, and because there was like a bunch of different. Mm. It was it's not Shira like close up. Yeah. yeah, Shira P- Shira Piven directed that episode. Uh-huh. Um, who's amazing? It was her first transparent episode that she oh, directed, cool. and. Uh, I think they, I don't know, We I think we just were like, you know, we, we also tried, you know, just, we just played with it for a long time. With cameras rolling. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. And yeah. you sort of warm up to it. And you go yeah. down that rabbit hole, like you're saying. Yeah, exactly. Whoa. And then all of a sudden it's lu- it's like lunch and you finished it and you're like, <gasps> Are you completely drained and... Oh, usually like, to- I mean, after that yeah. was like so exhilarating. And we just like giggled and hugged each other for a really long time. <laughs> it's a cathar- It seems like a cathartic show yeah. to work on. And we, all, I also knew that there was going to be a um, uh, a mikvah scene at the other end because we were like, how do we, mm. how do we like? Ch- I know Jill and the writers were like, how do we figure out this, like close the season for her? And it's just <laughs> you know beautiful. It was, of course, I was like, oh my god. But that's when you can't overthink. You can't. They don't yeah. overthink it. Like right. it just is so. It's like when you see it, you think, of course it's in a mikvah. Like that's yes. where she and Josh like first had their first scene. Yeah. In this empty, dry, barren mikvah, and then now she's mm-hmm. like in this full. It's so. It's yeah. Totally. It's, it is breathtaking. It really is. That whole show is really is really breathtaking because in it's just, it gets it seeps in your skin to me. That's yeah. what I mean. It just it's so simple. It's so simple. But it just feels so familiar. Just like it really does feel like you're watching home movies. Like there's something about it that just seeps in right. on such a cellular level. Like yeah. I just know this family you experience so it. well. Totally, totally. And yeah. I'm not Jewish. And you said you're not Jewish. Yeah. But like you said, this is the Pfeffermans are very somehow just very, very relatable. Mm. Maybe because they're so specific and so the charisma yes. aspect helps too. But how did you prepare for the role in terms of the religion aspect of it? Did you do a ton of research, or what is your <laughs> what, what is your like, like relationship no. with religion? <laughs> like, um, I yeah, I went to Catholic school my whole life, right? Um, all the way up through high school, and had a really complicated, um, which we don't need to get into, right? But, <laughs> but it is it's complicated. Um, but 
Yes, I did. I did love a uniform, though, I will say. <laughs> it's like the Amish thing, too. <laughs> it's totally yeah, the Amish it's thing. It's totally the costumes. I the... didn't mind it. Right. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's very complicated. So when I when Jill um, asked me about playing a rabbi, hmm. I was, of course, like, I was so excited by that challenge because it is hmm. so other. Like, there was so much. I just knew that there was going to be so much fun actor like stuff to totally because it was so outside myself. Mm. I, I thought mm-hmm. and that turns out, of course, it's never is that far. But <laughs> um, I, I, she hooked me up with this rabbi, Susan Goldberg, mm-hmm. who's a friend of hers and who's a beautiful brain and an incredible human. And she's a mom and she was a modern dancer and she became a rabbi. Mm. She's married. She became a, ra- a rabbi kind of later in life. And mm. she's just uh, uh, the raddest. And so we we spent uh, some time together mm. and she suggested some books. Like I read some books. I didn't try to like, you know, learn Hebrew because I, I just felt mm. like that would be not valuable as an actor. Mm. To learn the entire language, you mean? Well, yeah, I just yeah. like to spend that time doing something. It just felt like it was kind of putting something on that wasn't really penetrating. Like, I just needed to find, mm. like, what the real in was. And Almost like a trick. You don't want a trick. You want to... Yeah, well, yeah, or it just felt like a, it. it would just feel fake or not useful. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, um, totally. And so it was more... I think it was about spending time with her and sitting across from Susan and taking in her eye contact... I think Whoa, sounds yeah. described, but like no, she just yeah. the way she took me in was very. Um, you can learn kind of more the way that, that way. you were describing Judith, honestly. Yeah, like our staring amazing into Judith your soul. Light. Yeah, that you just feel seen in a way that yeah. you're like that. This is uh, there's something very profound in her stillness. Yeah, and in her listening, and so I think it was through hmm. through that was my key in to Raquel. I think for sure, at least at yeah. first, that she sort of influ- she was an inspiration, mm. but also. The act of her listening and you listening to her. It's all about listening. I had to drop. Yeah. I had to yeah. drop from my my a little bit of like a like a squirrel brain myself. And I had to like learn how to drop it down for the rabbi. Like she's Ooh. just much more centered, I think. Oh, cool. Yeah. And maybe that's the thing with season three with her. She becomes uncentered. That's yeah, it's absolutely. She's, it's she crisis starts to that spiral. Faith, that she's grounded in her faith and it crumbles yeah yeah or is crumbling yeah i mean for sure she's a pickup and i think it's hard for any i mean oh my god my stomach is so loud right now do you oh my god do you need food no we have like f- five or ten more minutes <laughs> depending on but she, like no hours. I, listen i don't even think that this is food related i think i'm just doing a lot of like <laughs> oh your body's just settling in <laughs> it's <laughs> so anyway, you're welcome. Jamie can edit it out, maybe. <laughs> or amplify it, <laughs> depending on how it's going. We were going to talk about burgers this whole time instead. Oh, right. <laughs> in and out. Right. But, um... Uh, we haven't even gotten to I Love Dick, which we should talk about, All right, come on, briefly. come on. I Love Dick. You were not nominated for I Love Dick, so we should be talking no. about Transparent. But I Love mm. Dick, I feel, is an ex- is just an extension of your collaboration with Jill to kind of to an nth degree, it's a totally different character. Yeah, and uh, kind of a way for you to be the heart of a show and to be the lead in a show. Mm-hmm. Is there a huge distinction between being a supporting and a lead character in a show? I mean, not in this world for some reason, okay. because uh, well, there is it. There is. It certainly feels like a little bit easier when they're when you're there every day. You don't have to try to like. You don't feel like a guest so right. so much. Although in transparent, you never. I mean, I never. I I know all these people so well yeah. at this point that it feels just like a, a family completely. But Amazing. I, um, but no, there was you know it was it was a it was a a lot. But we also I also knew that I was in this journey like we were you know going through it together and figuring it out and we I was mm. just so excited by the challenge of it for sure I love the source material so mm-hmm. much and um Sarah Gubbins this amazing playwright from Chicago who wrote the pilot and is just tr- a tremendous human she you know we were around, it was us and Jimmy Frona our DP was there like every day as well who's like mm-hmm. kind of I always call him a, our emotional script supervisor cuz he's like really Ooh. the one who's 
with us every day and watching. And so, yeah, that it's was heaven, 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 yeah. heaven. That yeah. show. I'm super proud of it. Yeah, it's it's a great opportunity, again, to kind of wade in the waters of drama, between drama and comedy. Yeah. But it's brainy as hell. It's brainy and sexy like, yeah, at the same both. time. Yeah, I yeah. know. I feel like it's really like a sexy show. And without contradicting Mm-mm. each other. Yeah. No. And it is also really brainy. And uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, and of, you know, it's a, it's a, a Soloway joint. So it's like super political in a way that I'm, mm. turns me on. Yeah. And, um, I, f- I feel like it's in it. Yeah. I, I loved it. I love the questions that we were asking again. It's all the Judaism. questions. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But also all about the challenges. Like it mm. sounds like you are not going to settle for a type like you're not going to get typecast. That's not a, a thing for you. I haven't had. I haven't. I haven't had to, which is no. kind of amazing. And I don't. I there was a ch- especially after Raquel, hmm. there was something really. Who is I, I'm so in love with her that there is something really, really. I was very excited about um, um, stepping into this someone who's this my myopic. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like her, like I mean, Ra- Raquel is so has such a warm heart and is yeah. so open, and mm. Chris is such like a ferret. <laughs> yes, totally. <laughs> that it was really re- is the this word. Chris, not the real Chris, but there is something about her, <laughs> the, her, um, you know, her tunnel vision that was really fun, fun to fun. step inside. Yeah, for sure, it's funny. Yeah, yeah, crazy funny, and also like just. Uh, uh, just a cringy a horror, you know you see it right. and you're like oh my god I want to watch it through like you know my fingers but it, <laughs> yes. and, yeah, totally. and not to have any judgment on her at all like just to that's what I also love about it is like you know we kept you know we kept knowing that like unlikable was going to be thrown around and we just kept to, that to their word. that word and yeah. to like our to Jill and Gubbins and all, all of our credits I think it was, we just kept pushing farther into it just to see what was on the other side and it's such an exciting time i think for um uh the for these kind of characters at the helms of shows which makes me proud to be a human yeah for sure what is the deal with unlikable like what i don't know please talk to me about it flattering thing is that a oh that actor's so brave for right taking the character there but like isn't that in the script and like the writer's not wondering if the audience is going to find them likable or right. not. Like, I know. I, I It shouldn't think seem to be a priority. It I don't know. shouldn't be a priority at all. Or what does it mean? No, You're yeah. right. I don't know. I think that there is something about it that means like either a couple things. Like either the person watching is unable to connect for whatever the reason. Can't like quite like yeah, latch sure. on. Yeah. Like maybe it's not this a story that they're it's familiar with, like or it's empathy. like a, an yeah. empathy yeah. question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think sometimes it, it could be equal to unattractive, which is totally. like a bummer. Yeah, and and like you said, you as an actor, you're not sitting there judging the character in a good way or in a bad way. No. Like you're not there to be like, well, my character is evil, and therefore I have to put them in a box and judge them. Right. And on the flip side, like, but still also have like a I want to make sure they're the not audience. unlikable. Right. Like, that's right. not a thing either. Right. Well, which was just helpful. Like, listen, I, you know, I, some people. I this one was definitely I we didn't have any <laughs> concern. I mean, I think there was something about her like, you know, she is selfish. Yeah, she's she's ambitious, ambitious. She's yeah. owning her. She's insecure. And she's she's a, owning her desire. She's like, right. And she's, she's a woman loud. doing all of those things. So, that's, yes. Yeah. She's loud. She's older. Yeah. She's, sure. you know, she's childless. She's like all of it. Like there's, she's, Crazy. a. it is a real, and it's not like this Chris is the only character that's like, you know, uh, exactly. out, out there like that. But it is, I think that you're so right. There is something about that where that every time we say unluckable, it would drive us crazy. Cause we're like, what do you mean when you say that? Cause yeah. I get it. If you don't connect, like you can totally not connect. Yeah. You know? Do you, do you read reviews? <laughs> I do. Really? I mean, I don't all the time, but I do. And I really do find some of them, like, I, I find them constructive, honestly. Even really? If they, I do. What's wrong with me? No, I mean... A I, lot of actors say that they don't, and I wonder if they always are tr- telling the truth. <laughs> telling the truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But well, I do. that thing of, like, if I read the positive reviews, I have to read the negative reviews, too, because that's only fair. 
Right. But you're saying it is constructive, and maybe especially for television because of TV well, you learn shows a lot, ongoing. and they can, they're yeah. ongoing, and you can learn a lot about how stuff is landing and how, how, how and if it's landing in the way that you you know some stuff you can you can. Yeah, these are all smart brains that are writing these things. Right. And you, you know. can do you follow certain smart brains and say, oh, I want to check in on what this person's saying about this season of Transparent or this. I I mean, yeah, sometimes. I, yeah. I mean, or like it's only when it comes out. Like I'm not like, yeah. you know, I, I don't usually read reviews for other people's stuff, I guess. But yeah. like when something uh-huh. feels weird. <laughs> <laughs> feel for you. But I do, uh, you know, when something's yeah. coming out, it's not like I make a point. I just don't, I don't purposefully not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you, do you read people's uh, journalists' profiles of you? I've never asked this either. No. Do you not? Oh. Wait, what do you mean? You mean like when you give an interview and you... Oh! Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. Because I wonder sometimes. I well, you know, not. It depends on whether or not, like, uh, you know, the I have two children, so I can't be like, children, please, mommy's reading something. Gather around. Gather (laughs) around. I shall read aloud my interview. (laughs) Wait, give mommy another half an hour. I've got to read something I that I dictated last week. (laughs) Right, exactly. And then we stage it. That's how they learn to read. They would just read mommy's profile, (laughs) stare at the pretty pictures, and listen to her on podcasts. Podcasts. That's right. (laughs) Exactly. Um, Let me get to. Let me just ask some quick. I mean, you've spoken to backstage before, so you've, I'm sure you've given these answers before, but like, sure, sure. what is your number one piece of acting advice? If you could go back Ugh. in time and give that uh, receptionist one piece of advice. I would say, I mean, and this maybe uh, will sound contrary to what I, or contradictory to what I just said, but I would say stop, stay off the internet for a lot of oh, nonsense uh-huh. about yourself. Oh, just like a lot of nonsense There's in general? Nonsense. or. I just think the internet can be just in terms of our like creative world can sometimes be is can sometimes just do, fuel the wrong fires. Yeah. So yeah. It, whether it's reading about somebody else or yourself, I just think it's mm-hmm. it's nonsense. Like in like little mm. press times, of you know, of course I'm like, oh, I'm curious yeah. to see how. But like I, I'm. It's not like I am. I'm on no social media myself, and I think a lot of it helps a lot of actors and yeah. creatives, and I totally respect that. But for for me, I always find that I start thinking about the wrong things. Right. Is that on? Is that like the that feeling of when you're in the audition room and you see other people there and you start comparing yourself to them and you start wondering like yes. oh they're going to go for that person or that person yes. that person's prettier than I am or that yes or how you're being received which is not necessarily yeah. like always the most valuable productive line of thinking yeah 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 because yeah. it, it's it's just anything that's going to get you in the way of your um faith in yourself yeah yeah that and also the other piece of advice which I, which is not to worry about memorizing your audition scenes oh okay yeah <laughs> So That's I think sometimes advice. that can that can really trip one up. If you feel like you have to know it, then you're thinking about that instead mm-hmm. of like just being present. And then you're not flexible. Yeah. In the audition room. Exactly. That's excellent advice. Um, I also am always curious, like going off of that idea of you want constructive criticism or construction, yeah. you know, that you read. Do you give a performance or an audition <laughs> And think back. Oh, like oh, I should have done that. Oh, I should have done that. I should have tried that. Oh, oh goodness! Is that a constant thing for actors? Or for I mean, you? I'm not so much anymore. But okay. But because I also feel like I'm better about asking for another take. Like uh-huh. I, I'm really, I'm getting much more confident in hmm. not leaving until I feel satisfied that I've tried cool. at least stuff that's a big step but i didn't bef- i didn't no 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 certainly not Mm-mm. you're not walking oh on the set and being like give oh, me 30 I'm like, takes. what did i say what did i do what yeah. did i say oh my god yeah, yeah 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 of course oh my god oh i that's was like i was not a great auditioner at all i would just yeah. like push 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 yeah push. and that's not gonna flow no and then i, I just follow everyone just like i could just smell need uh-huh you know that's the opposite of what yeah what actors kind of what want, you want. Okay, and then last question, going back to what something you said earlier, because if that confidence that you've kind of accrued over yeah. the course of your career, how much does being a mom have to do with that, do you think? <sighs> how did that change you as an actor? Oh, my goodness. Well, here's an example. Like I used, to, I remember, like, back in the day, pre-kids, where I would have an audition and there would be, like, it would be, like, the day would 
be would literally like circle like, would be around the uh, audition you know like i'd structure my day for that audition yes yes and it's just too much like it ended up being event. just like too much heat on something yeah and so having you just i don't have the luxury of that time anymore yeah, cool and so i think there is something about about just giving a, a making economic and gut you have to make choices really fast based on and, and listen to your gut yeah cool and so i think that's better you don't have the, the, the luxury of just like indulging and like oh should i lift the cup like it doesn't matter like all that stuff actually doesn't matter just like know you what you want you know know who you are what you're trying to get and and show up ready to listen i feel like excellent (laughs) show up ready to listen that's the perfect end note (laughs) darling it was such a pleasure this was such a pleasure thank you so much los angeles (laughs) thank you thank you for having me (laughs) you are welcome Show up ready to listen. There it is, actors. God, that was such such an amazing interview. (laughs) It was hysterical. Uh, Yeah, I feel warm and fuzzy all over. That was so great. (laughs) There's so many consistencies between the two interviews. Mm. Very, very different energy. (laughs) Yeah, and they both, even though they both have such a different energy, they both are of the Jill Soloway School of Acting and School of Thought, um, which is just that place of really grounded but creativity, like grounded freedom, like it, that's the contradiction that plays out in her shows. And that's why <laughs> Transparent is just like one of my favorite shows. I'm so glad that we got to do an entire podcast episode for uh, two of its nominated actors. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the, the interesting thing for me is that the show is all about a family and, and they do seem like mm. a family talking about each other it's so much, yeah. as well as on screen. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, that was amazing. Um, Shall we roll credits? Yeah, I think so. Be sure to like, rate, and subscribe for more interviews from the front lines of the 2017 Emmy race in the Envelope and Awards podcast is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA in Los Angeles. Thank you, as always, to producer, editor, and all-around podcast wizard, Jamie Muffet. You can follow him at JamieMusicNYC on Twitter. You can follow me, Jack Smart, on Twitter at JackSmartWrites. Thank you, as always, to the team at Backstage, the most trusted name in casting. That's Peter Rapoport, Ryan Remstad, Jesse Balashek, Francis Ramos, Mark Stinson, Rowan Alkatib, and especially, definitely, without a doubt, Casey Howe. For more awards and industry coverage, head over to Backstage.com. Thanks for listening. Tune in next time for another glimpse in the envelope. <laughs>